years ago. Uh, I was driving down the uh, highway one night with my radio on, my satellite radio, and moving around flipping channels, and I caught a, uh, an interview with Waylon Jennings. Now, Waylon Jennings is deceased now, but he, he, was, uh, he, he grew up in Churches of Christ. He later on, he turned his back on the church, and I don't think he, he would demonstrate any kind of uh, faith or religion that I'm of uh, at the end of his life. But uh, he's telling about how that he's just getting started in show business. And this would have taken him back, this would have been probably the late 50s, early 60s maybe. And he's in a band, and he's uh, on a train, and the train stops at a train station in some big city out west. And people uh, get off and others get on. And he says this one striking figure got on the, the, uh, the, the train. And he said he had uh, really elegant clothing. And he had <coughs> white hair, silver hair, and it was all poofed up. And he, this guy was just somebody that... And, and William said in this interview, he said, I didn't know who he was, W-U-Z. He said, I didn't know who he was but I knew he weren't no ordinary feller. <laughs> I like that, you see, because, and he's talking about this guy you see on the screen. Uh, this picture would, would have been taken years uh, earlier. His name was Lash LaRue, and he was um, a famous uh, uh, cowboy, movie cowboy, and so he was a star. And so uh, uh, when, uh, when William Jennings saw him, he said, I didn't know who he was, but I knew he weren't no ordinary feller. Well, I want to talk to you tonight about someone that you know, or perhaps you've heard of, uh, but we need to be reminded that he is no ordinary fellow. As a matter of fact, he is extraordinary. This man is amazing. And it's very important for us to understand that some people uh, are given the opportunity by God to be uh, extraordinary and, and to, to live a life that is... Uh, you might say special. Now this man Elijah is a man that uh, I'm telling you, he's just uh, he's just uh, beyond the pale. He's in the Old Testament and he's in the New Testament and he's in the future. This man has been around and will apparently be around for a while, and yet the Scripture says that he is an ordinary, or rather, he is an actual human being like you and I are. Let me take you to John chapter 1 to start. The Gospel of John chapter 1. And verse 6. There came a man who was sent from God. Now that could be said of uh, Elijah. But we're talking about John the Baptist. And it, uh, the, the, the very interesting thing about the way these two men lived their lives. The way they dressed the way they lived, the way they behaved. They both dressed the same in the same rugged sort of way and they were outdoorsmen, you know, and, and they were strong and they were courageous and they were bold and they were brave. And so there came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. Now I'm skipping on over to verse uh, 19. Now this was John's testimony. When the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confess freely, I am not the Christ, he said. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? Now why would the, the messengers and the priests and the Levites ask John the Baptist, are you Elijah? Because Elijah lived a long time before, hundreds of years before. But the amazing thing about Elijah was that he didn't die um, of an ordinary death. As a matter of fact, he didn't actually die. He's like uh, another person in the Old Testament, the man Enoch uh, in Genesis chapter 5. And the scripture says that Enoch walked with God. Now, when the Bible uses the word walk, it means that you live a certain way. In other words, if we walk by the Spirit, Romans 8, that means we're living and we're being led by the Spirit and the Spirit's Word, which is, of course, uh, the Bible. But the Scripture says that Enoch walked with God, and one day he was no more, for God took him. In other words, he 
he didn't die. He wasn't buried. Um, there's no tombstone for Enoch. He just was taken by God. And we preachers always say that, uh, and we'd like to think of it like this, that one day Enoch and God were walking together, and um, when the day came to an end, God said to Enoch, Enoch, uh, we walked so far today that I think it's closer to my home than it is to yours, so why don't you just come home with me? Well, that's a sweet little way of, uh, of imagining uh, the, the way that Enoch's life on earth ended. But Elijah, Elijah's life, and, his, and, and the ending of his uh, earthly existence ended in a way that is far more sensational uh, than Enoch being just taken, taken away and existed no more. And so uh, why again would with the, with the people in that day and time ask John the Baptist, are you Elijah? The reason they asked that question, there are two reasons for it. Number one, Elijah left uh, in a way we'll read about either tonight or next Sunday night, in a way that was uh, so extraordinary that it was just beyond the pale of anything that we can imagine. Because he left in a chariot of fire, pulled by horses of fire. And he just, but that's not all. That's one reason why they wondered, oh, do, are you John the Baptist? I mean, are you Elijah the Baptist, John the Baptist? The other reason was, the scripture says, that God is going to send Elijah to announce the coming of the Messiah. <coughs> hmm. So that's why they knew that Elijah was going to come back at some point, and so they said, are you Elijah? Okay, before we get to, too excited here, let's go to James chapter 5, and, and let's read what the scripture says about this amazing man, Elijah, because of all the things that he was able to do with God's help, of course, and by God's power, um, it's very important for us to understand that this man was human. Verse 16, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. Let me repeat that. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the heavens, and the earth rather, produced its crops. And so the scripture is very plain to say that Elijah, even though he's involved in some sensational things as he partners with God, he's a human being like we are. Now, why is that important to know? It's important to know because we need to be open to God using us. Now, don't hear me saying that you might be taken away in a chair of fire one of these days. That's not the point. The point is simply this. God does his amazing work through his children. Now, I'm not saying that he does all his work exclusively through his children because God can do things, uh, you know, separate and apart from us. I mean, uh, he didn't use us to create the, uh, the sun or the universe. Uh, Jesus is the creator of all the universe, the Bible says in Colossians 1. But God is working through his children and he's, and he's working his purpose and his way through us. And so while Elijah sets the bar way up there, all of us need to believe that somewhere we are fitting in God's purpose and God's eternal plan to work His will among men and among nations. And so we just need to be open and then we need to be ready to be used. We need to serve in whatever, whatever uh, way we can what, with whatever opportunities we're faced with and with whatever talents and abilities and gifts that God has endowed us with to use them to His glory because if God used Elijah, He can use us as well. Okay, let's do a little bit of a review of this, uh, this sermon. We'll come back to Are You Elijah in just a little while. Um, Elijah lived no ordinary life. He spoke truth to power. He became a fugitive. He created endless food. He restored a life. He destroyed the prophets of Baal. He brought back the rain. 
after having the rain stop because of his prayer. He lived under a death sentence. He was fed by an angel. How many of us have experienced that? He suffered from depression. Some of us can relate to that. And he recruited Elisha, who was a great man of himself. As a matter of fact, Elisha was given a double uh, uh, portion of the blessing that Elijah had. And sometimes recruiting the right person to carry on good work is a, is a very important thing. Elijah was a man who lived, who died no ordinary death, and we'll get to that later. And he uh, uh, is, will, will demonstrate no ordinary return to earth. But we're going to see him back on earth, even in the New Testament. And it's very exciting to think about the fact that he has no ordinary future. This man is special, 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 special. Okay, so let's look at uh, let's look at some of these passages that teach some things about Elijah. Let's go to the last book in the Old Testament, and this will be Malachi. And we're looking at uh, chapter three, verse one. See, I will send my messenger, who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Now the point to say here is, is that God says, I'm going to send a messenger. And he's announcing the coming of the King, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself. Moving on to chapter 4, verse 5. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah. Now, Elijah's already been gone from earth a long time. By the time this is written, the Holy Spirit writes this through Malachi. And Malachi is saying, I'm going to send. He's already said, I'm going to send a prophet, a messenger. Now we find out that that messenger is Elijah. He says, I'll send the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And he will turn. He goes on to say, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. And so the Jews know that Elijah is supposed to return. They know it because uh, uh, they, they lived and breathed the Old Testament. And that they were aware. And so when John the Baptist comes, dressed like he's dressed and acting the way he's acting and preaching what he's preaching, and talking the way he's talking and behaving the way he's behaving. And they, they said, who are you? And he said, I'm not the Christ. That's the first thing out of his mouth. Don't think that I'm the Savior. I'm here to announce the Savior. And so they said, oh, so you're Elijah. And of course he says at that point, um, no, I'm not Elijah. But we're going to learn later that Jesus said that John the Baptist was Elijah. Not literally, but figuratively. He was the Elijah uh, that the Old Testament prophet Malachi said would come back to earth. But then the real Elijah does show up in the New Testament as well. And we'll see that in a little while. And so uh, moving to the next slide. We're, we're talking some now about the extraordinary uh, life of Elijah. And we're going to start with... Uh, We'll go to the Old Testament. We'll go to 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings 16. Because we're going to see that this man is speaking truth to power. And as a result of that, he gets himself, you might say, in some hot water. He gets himself into some trouble. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes when you teach the truth and stand for the truth and preach the truth, you're going to make some people unhappy. It just happens that way. Well, Elijah gets himself in trouble with of all people, the government, and the king, and the queen. And the king and the queen, Ahab and Jezebel, are evil people. Now, when you get powerful, evil people after you, you're in trouble. And so Elijah gets himself in trouble right away. Um, by the way, he's called, in verse 1 of chapter 17, Elijah the Tishbite. Now, the reason the Bible points that out is that there are at least three other Elijahs mentioned in the Old Testament. And they're not good guys. And so the scripture is pointing out which Elijah uh, is the one who speaks truth to power. 
It's not these other Elijahs that's mentioned in other places who lived at other times uh, in, in history. We're talking about a particular Elijah. It's kind of like, uh, suppose someone uh, with the same name as yours goes out and does something uh, bad. Uh, maybe they're notorious criminal, whatever. And then you introduce yourself in a crowd and you say, I'm the good Dennis, I would say. I'm not the one, I'm not the notorious criminal Dennis. I, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the particular kind of. Well, anyway, um, Ahab wants to do business with the king of Tyre. And the king of Tyre is a bad guy also. And so they get into cahoots with each other. And Ahab winds up marrying his daughter, the king of Tyre's daughter. Her name is Jezebel. Well, Jezebel is very religious. Well, what kind of religion does she practice? She practices idolatry. She practices the worship of Baal. And, uh, and she converts Ahab to this. And then he sets up a temple. We're going to read about this. He sets up a temple in Samaria, which is a part of uh, what we would call the, 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 the Bible lands, a part of Israel. And, and uh, as a result of this, Elijah says, I'm going to have to say something about this. Well, let, let's start in uh, verse 29, uh, 1 Kings chapter 16. In the 38th year of King Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel. And he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Eth, Eth, let's see, Ethbel, king of the Sidonians, that's the same thing as Tyre, and began to serve Baal and to worship him. And he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole, that's a, that's a an idol, um, and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. In Ahab's time, Pile of Bethel rebuilt Jericho and laid his foundations at the cost of his firstborn son Abraham. But we'll, we'll go about that later. And so, here we are now learning about Ahab and what a bad guy he is and how that he has provoked the anger of the Lord. Well, when you provoke the anger of the Lord, you just, you're going to pay the price. You just can't get by with it. The amazing thing about God is that he takes his time. He doesn't. Now, there's a time or two in the scripture where he zaps someone. In other words, they're just struck dead just all of a sudden. And we think about Ananias and Sapphire in the New Testament. And we think about the, the Sunday, uh, Nadab and Abihu in the Old Testament. Uh, and how when they touched that Ark of the Covenant, they were, it's almost like they were electric. They died suddenly. But it's amazing how patient God is and how long he will wait and work his way trying to change hearts and minds and attitudes and behavior. And this is the way it is even with Ahab. And so, chapter 17. Now, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishban Gilead uh, said to Ahab, he speaks to the king. It takes a lot of nerve to speak to the king. I'll just tell you this, especially when your message to the king is one that you know the king is not going to like. And Ahab is not going to like what he's about to hear. As the Lord lives, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, Elijah says, there will neither be dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Now you say, well, Elijah, you must be just very full of yourself in order to think that you can just stop the clouds from raining and you can control weather. No, Elijah has a relationship with God Almighty. And Elijah knows that he's, what he's saying, he can accomplish with and by the power of God. And so he speaks to, to Ahab this way. And of course, uh, the rain stops. And it doesn't rain for three and a half years. And so here is a man who is speaking power, uh, speaking truth to power, you might say. Verse 18. After a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went, uh, uh, so Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab had summoned Obadiah, his palace administrator. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. 
And while Jezebiah was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, fifty in each, and supplied them with food and water. Ahab said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs and valleys. Maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so we will not have to kill any of our animals. So they divided the land they were to cover, Ahab going in one direction and Obadiah in the other. Now, as Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met him. Obadiah recognized him, bowed down to the ground and said, Is it really you, my lord, Elijah? Yes, replied. he replied. Go tell your master, Elijah is here. What have I done wrong, he asked Obadiah, that you were handing your servant over to Ahab to be put to death? As sure as the Lord your God lives, there is not a, a nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to look for you. And whenever a nation or kingdom claimed that you were not there, he made them swear that they could not find you. But now you tell me to go to my master and to say Elijah is here in town and this nation. I don't know where the spirit of the Lord may carry you when I leave you. If I go and tell Ahab and he doesn't find you, he will kill me. Yet I, your servant, have worshipped the Lord since my youth. Haven't you heard, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord? I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in two caves, fifty in each, and supplied them with food and water. And now you tell me to go to my master, come at Ahab, and say, Elijah is here? He will surely present myself, I'm sorry, uh, in, in Elijah's here, he will kill me. Elijah said, as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went up to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to them, is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have uh, not made trouble for Israel, Elijah said, but you, and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands, and you have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over the Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel, and bring the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. Well, what we're about to learn is that Elijah is becoming a fugitive, and he will have to flee for his life because of what he's about to do next. This is too good to rush through, and so let me just break it off right here. And when we come back next Sunday night, we'll continue to talk about this amazing person by the name of Elijah. But just remember this. He's a human being just like you and me. And the Lord can use people who will trust him and obey him to do amazing things. You might not ever get to do things as exciting as Elijah. But you know, in the Lord's eyes, it's a, it's, it's a matter of scale. Anytime you trust Him, believe in Him, and obey His will, then He is pleased, He is glorified, and it's a big, big deal in His sight. So don't, don't look at yourself and your life and you say, well, I'm just a, I'm a quiet person, I'm an invisible person, and not very many people know me. Uh, I've never made a huge impact on this world. Just know uh, that even turning one soul to the Lord is huge. It's a big deal. And the example that we set and the encouragement that we give and the way that we build people up on a day-to-day -day basis, that's big. So we don't have to be as sensational and as exciting as Elijah in order to do things that please God and glorify Him. But let us at the same time look at people like Elijah and just be absolutely amazed at what God can do with a human being. Tonight as we sing this song of encouragement, the, uh, the plan of salvation, of course, is going to come up on the screen in just a moment. And we encourage you to obey the gospel, if you haven't already, as a believer, repenting of sin, confessing faith in Jesus, and receiving baptism for forgiveness of sin. Or if you need the prayers of the church, you're a child of God, you're a member of the church, and yet if you're carrying a heavy burden, perhaps you're depressed or discouraged, or just, you just need to know that your church family is praying with you for you. You'll never find a better time than right now to ask the church to pray with you. And so if you need to come for any reason, we invite you to come right now while the other is standing the same. 